Hi everyone, welcome back to Casual Physics. My name is Matt and in today's video we're going to be talking about what actually happened in my first cold fusion experiment. It was six weeks ago and I've had quite a lot of people asking me, you know, just what happened? Did it work? Did it not? Did you show that cold fusion was real? Tell us about it. So that's what today's video is going to be about. Before we delve into the detail though, I think it's useful just to cast our minds back six weeks to refresh our memory as to what I was actually doing. Okay, I started with a lot of scrubbing and cleaning, plenty and plenty of sanding before I burnished the nickel mesh with palladium, put it into the reactor and then sealed it all up tight, sucked out the air, put hydrogen in the next day, heated it up and waited. So, the main idea with this experiment is that if there's something interesting happening inside the reactor, something that's producing an extra source of heat, then what it will do is it will make the reactor temperature rise above what it would normally like to sit at. This type of experiment was done in the past. A guy called Les Case was one of the people who I was inspired by. He observed a 20 degrees Celsius change in temperature, which was significant. And that's one of the things that drew me to this experiment because my equipment is well capable of measuring such a big temperature difference. Of course, what you can't say if you see a big temperature change is it's fusion. You've got to do more experiments to make sure that you can uh, rule out the possibility that it was some unknown chemical reaction perhaps the hydrogen interacting with some contaminant that you accidentally put in to the, the system, maybe some oil, some grease or something like that. Those type of contrast and comparing experiments I plan to do. I've not rushed to do them yet and there are two reasons for that. Firstly, it's just time. So I only can do my fusion 50% of the time, two weeks out of every four. The other two weeks, I have to work to get money to pay my bills just like everybody has to. Um, and actually as a secondary a side point, if anybody watching this just happens to have some spare Bitcoin, some spare dollars, euros, pounds that are just burning a hole in their pocket and they'd like to help this effort, I've put some links in the description below where you can donate if you feel inclined. But honestly, no pressure just you being here watching this video is enough for me. But it's just on the off chance that you have a bit of spare cash. So that's the first reason I haven't rushed to do these comparison experiments. The second reason is because honestly, I'm just not convinced that I've seen a significant temperature rise in the data from my first experiment. And to understand that, uh, what I'm gonna do now is just to dive into the data and show you what I've seen and to show you my analysis of that. So I've been doing my analysis using a coding language called Python and using a platform called Jupyter Labs, which allows me to write my thoughts, write my code and visualize my data all in one place. So won't you join me for a little bit of a deep dive into some data? Okay, this is a Jupyter notebook. Don't worry, we're not going to be going through it in all its detail. For those of you who are interested to do that, I've put a link in the description below where you can download this notebook and also the data that we are analyzing so that you can play around with it to your heart's content. For the rest of us though, let's just go with the flow and have a look at the data. Here it is. This is the temperature data I acquired on August 23rd got up at around six o'clock, went to bed at around three. It was an exciting, but it was a really long day. This temperature data consists of three regions. So the first part of the experiment was when I was just heating the reactor with no hydrogen in it. Then I put the hydrogen in and some interesting things happened. And then I took out the hydrogen at around three, no, 2.30, and then I let the whole thing just cool down naturally. The most interesting bit is obviously this middle part. What we're really interested in understanding is, does this temperature go significantly above the baseline? Now, what do we mean by baseline? The baseline is the temperature at which the reactor would get to if I didn't put any hydrogen in. 
To understand what that temperature is, we need to look at this heating region first. So let's zoom in on that. So here we are, 7 to 11.30. I can now fit a curve to this data. So build a model. And let's do that. I'll spare you the details. And now this model, when I overlay it on top of the data, it fits it very well. And I can now use that model to predict into the future. And that will tell me what the temperature of the reactor would have been if I didn't put any hydrogen in. And so let's have a look at that alongside the temperature data when we put the hydrogen in. That's this. So hydrogen goes in around 11.30 and then all weird stuff happens, which we'll talk about. Here is the baseline temperature, which is 187. Okay, where do we begin with this data? Firstly, these three big spikes. Basically, just ignore those. These spikes are there because those times I was playing with the gas pressure. I was sucking out hydrogen, putting new hydrogen in at different pressures, just to play about with it to see what happened. There's nothing really meaningful we can get from these spikes. What else do we see? Well, most of these data points do seem like they're above the orange line. So we could claim that there's an extra source of heat going on inside. That's one thing that superficially that we see. Most of this temperature rise, so this top point here is around 192. So most of this five degree temperature rise happened within the first half an hour of me putting in the hydrogen. That's something else that we can see. And then thirdly, there just seems to be this general undulating character to the temperature, which frankly, I was, I was surprised about when I saw. Those are three observations that we can make. And it's tempting to start drawing conclusions from them. But what you should be asking at this point is, Matt, where the hell are the error bars in your data? Okay, so probably not that many people are asking that question. So we're just gonna take a slight detour to understand what error bars actually are before continuing. Okay, so let's think about something that's conceptually a bit simpler than cold fusion. Your height and how it's changed over time. Of course, as you were a little baby, you were very small and then you grew bigger, you had a growth spurt somewhere and eventually your height plateaued and you've probably been there at the same height for many, many years. I am currently, and I have been for a long time, 176 centimeters. Now, when I report that height to people, actually, they don't really know whether I'm 176 or whether I'm 176 0.5, maybe I'm actually that high, or maybe I'm a little bit smaller, 175.5 centimeters. The reason why is because I'm reporting my height to the nearest centimeter, so there is an error of plus or minus 0.5 centimeters. When we're representing data on a graph, we typically represent it as points like this, but what we really should do is represent our data as a range. Yes, give the point, so I'm 176, but I need to include the errors here, that I could be as high as 176.5 or as low as 175.5. And graphically, we represent those limits, the, li the upper and lower limits with these bars, and we join the bars together with a line. And so this type of kind of diagram, this type of way of representing a data point with these bars is called an error bar. Okay, detour over, now back to the data. Now we know what an error bar is, how can we apply them to our temperature data? When you look at the details of the temperature sensor, the thermocouple as it's called, what you'll find is it's accurate to within plus or minus 1.5 degrees. What that means is at each point, I need to put an error bar of plus 1.5 and minus 1.5. We can also propagate those errors into the model and also see a kind of confidence with our final steady state temperature. So let's have a look at that. This is the final graph, which I zoomed straight past. And you can see the data and the error bars around it, and also a confidence interval around the model, so that the final steady state temperature, the baseline, if you will. How do we read these type of graphs? Well, I'm gonna zoom in here so that it's a bit easier to see. 
instead of comparing a single data point here to the model, which is this middle orange line, and saying, oh, is there, a, is there a big difference? Instead, what we need to do is look at the bottom of the error bar, compare it with the top orange line here. This is the difference, which is meaningful. And you see that difference in temperature is a lot less than if we just took the data point and compared it to the model. So if we have a situation where the blue bar overlaps the orange, then we can't say anything at all. And if we look back to this initial region where we pump the hydrogen in, this is exactly what's happening. The blue error bars are pretty much overlapping the model. And so actually, I can't say anything about this. I can't even tell you whether it's really happening or not. I don't have enough accuracy in my thermocouple, my temperature sensor. I do appear to have enough accuracy in my temperature sensor to see that there has been a temperature rise, generally speaking, over much of the data. The maximum we've really seen, though, is about three degrees. Three degrees Celsius is the difference between the bottom of this error bar and the top of the orange line. So I guess the question is, can I really claim anything with a three degrees temperature rise? I'm not prepared to claim anything. Forget cold fusion for a moment. I'm not even prepared to claim that I've really seen a temperature rise above the baseline. And the reason is, A, I made an assumption when I made this orange model that the temperature in London was constant. And actually it wasn't. After I put the hydrogen in, the ambient temperature went from about 24 to 26. So that, ha that will have an effect on this baseline. And in addition, I don't know really that much about how my thermocouple behaves in a high temperature, high pressure hydrogen atmosphere. It may well be, and, and I really don't know this, it may be that this erratic behavior and may, maybe even the temperature itself might be impacted by the presence of hydrogen. So, long story short, if I'm going to be conservative with things, I think I'd have to say no, I didn't see any cold fusion in my first experiment. Honestly, I think if I had, I would have been the luckiest cold fusion researcher ever. So I'm not disappointed. For me, I learned a lot about just getting my experiment set up. I learned a lot about hydrogen, about palladium, and in the last six weeks, I've understood a lot more about the role that cycling the temperature up and down can have on activating the material. So I didn't do that. I just let the temperature go up to steady state. So I'm going to experiment with cycling the temperature. And also, I'd like to start using deuterium in my experiments instead of hydrogen. Okay, what is deuterium? It's technically what we call an isotope of hydrogen, which means it's very similar in a lot of ways, but deuterium is twice as heavy as hydrogen. If you speak to people in the cold fusion community, what you'll find is people say either that hydrogen just doesn't make cold fusion, in which case I shouldn't be surprised with my results. Other people say hydrogen does produce cold fusion, but just with 10 times less energy than if you used deuterium. And so with that, you might be asking, well, why didn't I just use deuterium to start with? The reason is very simple. It's just deuterium is really expensive. And that's because it's far less common than normal hydrogen. If we take water as an example of something that contains a lot of hydrogen, that's the H in H2O, the deuterium in just a glass of water that you might be drinking is 0.015% of all the hydrogen in that glass of water. So it's a small fraction that is possible to extract, to concentrate, and make something called heavy water that just contains the deuterium and no hydrogen, but it's an expensive process. In my setup, I need about two liters of heavy water in order to start making deuterium. That's going to set me back 1,100 pounds it's not cheap, but I'm determined to get this stuff because I think it's going to have a huge impact on the success of my next experiment. So in the spirit of crowdfunding, I've created a GoFundMe page. I've already got 800 out of the 1100 pounds, so I'm almost there. I've put a link in the description below if you're feeling like you have a bit of spare cash. Every little really does count, so I'm super appreciative of any support that you can give. And support isn't just about money. 
The fact that you're here watching, hopefully liking and subscribing, talking to your friends about cold fusion, that's super important. So I can't stress enough how grateful I am that you're here. Thank you once again for your time and attention. And I look forward to seeing you here again in a couple of weeks for some more casual physics.